on a story and for a very long time our characters had um, like a very placeholder uh, placeholder names so uh, for example there's a character in our game named Hakon but for a very long time for some reason like the, the narrative designer said okay we'll think of a cool name later so they named him Abdul and for a very long time he was Abdul. Well, not a big thing, right? So he was Abdul, but then it was all kind of localized, and we chose the name, so it was Hakon, everything worked, worked all right. But what happened then was that, so first of all, you get a different me me image when you hear Abdul and Hakon. So that's one thing, that's the same example as big guy and a demolisher, or a monster and a demolisher. But another thing is that when you, when, when, when we started, we also, when so Abdul was kind of created, we were creating AI presets for him, and there were some, I don't know, like uh, his mesh, for example, was created by artists, so everyone named the preset, the mesh, the sounds connected with the mesh, the textures as Abdul. And then suddenly you move into the production, and some new people come in, and, they, and Abdul is already Hakon, they start working on Hakon, they know that they have to, let's say, uh, fix the mesh model for Hakon. They look for Hakon, but Hakon is not in the, in, the, in the game scripts because it's named Abdul. So, maybe a small thing, but it really wastes a lot of time. Um, so, the choice of, so that's actually something that I spent a lot of time when working on a design. And I think it's really important to, if you have keywords, key names in your design for your features, like really, sp not just, don't just write them and you will get back to them later. You need to find the most correct words at a given time that describe the feature and communicate it most precisely. Yeah, that's the, 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 the Abdul Hakon thing. And actually, there's another rule or another truth that relates to what I said, and this is uh, a truth I have learned from Martin Kapusta. He is our senior gameplay, gameplay and systems programmer, and also do a lot of line walking, as you can see. He's quite good at it. And he said, at one point, uh, he said, Timon, you know what? I think we're doing one thing wrong, and I would like us to change this. I think we should always refactor and optimize everything that we have in the game. Always update your project so it really represents the most up-to-date version of what you're working on. And as I said, uh, when you work on a big project, uh, when you work, work on a big project, we also had the... We were fortunate but also unfortunate enough to work on a project Dying Light 2, which was in parts based on a previous project, Dying Light 1, there will be a lot of things that will be done in a very hacky way. Like someone was trying to, and it also relates to the mantra of fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. You do things fast and, and cheap and easy, but the, 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 the bad thing is that, and that's good, but then at some point they stay in the game. So you get Abdul's where you should have Hakon, you should get some very quick and dirty implementations and code that actually should do, should, should do better, should be better prepared for what's coming um, ahead. So those hackish prototypes, those script definitions done in Notepad, they work, okay. And you can spend some time in production with, with, that, with that state of the project, with that mindset. But then there comes a time when you have to finalize your project, when you have to really make everything polished and kind of brush everything so it's clean and fresh and sparky. And only then those things start to fall apart. And only then, when you really don't have that much time and you really want to focus on the most important thing, you realize all of those skeletons in your closet and all of those hacky implementations. So that's, imp that's why, it's, why it is important to constantly think about refactoring and optimizing your code, refactoring and optimizing everything that's in the game, updating your documentation, updating your scripts, clearing and removing all of the definitions for items, enemies that aren't used. This, this really saves a lot of time at the end of the project where the time is really, really crucial. crucial. Because you don't want to spend that time on untangling some mysteries from the past. 
Okay. That's number six and number seven from this guy. Uh, Maciek Pinkowski, a uh, great friend of mine, a game designer from Techland, currently at Remedy. I think he works on Alan Wake 2, which I envy, for which I envy him a lot because I expect good things from the game. His name is Magic, but he was kind of presenting himself saying Magic, hey, I'm Magic, which felt kind of funky to me, but he really is uh, like a Magic type of guy. He has a lot of energy, he has a lot of passion, he shares his knowledge, he shares his that energy with everyone, so really a guy to love. And one thing he said that simple beats complex. And again, we kind of get back to what I said previously about optimizing and refactoring. Maybe also a little to fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. That is a truth. As, a game, des as game designers, I think mostly, but maybe also as game developers, we want to really create things that are like, that we can be proud of, that are complex and big and, and interconnected, etc., etc. But that's not true. Like the complexity comes from the fact that you have simple systems in your game and they work together. Always think about how you can simplify your designs. Also because, well, simple things are simpler. They are simpler to implement. They work in a clearer way in the game. They impact the experience in a more predictable way. They are also simpler to, to iterate and also simpler to explain to players. And I have a something that actually what you see here is, is, is a thing that a lot of players hate. It's like the Ubisoft way of tutorialization where you have three panels where explain how the feature works. I understand the hate. I'm not sure I, I agree with it because I think this is, I, I'm using this as a test to see if the feature is designed in the most effective way. If you are able to explain your feature using those three panels, if you can distill how it works into those three simple steps, you do this, then this happens, and you get this as a reward, then it means that it really is simple. And then it means that it can really contribute to the game without making it too complex, without making it too unpredictable for the players and too unclear for the players. And this, but that's one test. I'm using this actually quite a lot. When I work with game designers, junior game designers, this is kind of the test I put them through. So they start thinking in that mindset. But there's also an even more ultimate test. So if you're having doubts, if you are good with your, with your feature, then now the ultimate test. Try to explain your feature, your design to your mom. Or maybe, I don't know, a friend who doesn't play games, but actually mom is the best. So moms usually don't play games. My mom, she played, well actually right now she plays a lot of solitaire, obviously. Uh, but like a real game that she played, another Suhari, uh, the real game that she played, I remember she played it on Amiga when I was like a way younger. Uh, it was called Baba Yaga. I don't remember much about the game, but it was like a Baba Yaga character walking through a forest doing stuff. For some reason, it really kind of engaged her and enchanted her a lot. But I think that's the only real game that she played and completed. So if I really want to kind of make sure that it's easy enough, it's simple enough, it's simple enough, I try to explain that to my mom. Usually I fail, okay? I think that at one point I'd be able to do that, but it's also a very nice interaction with moms, so like always appreciate it. So that's number seven. Number eight, <laughs> it's actually an East African proverb. Uh, I didn't learn this from this guy, though I would like to smoke what he has in his pipe. So the proverb is, you probably know this, it's, it takes a village to raise a child. But of course, we're not raising a child, we are making video games, so it takes a village to make a game. Why? Well, um, all due respect, the beautiful, amazing, full of knowledge lady on the, on the, on the screen. If you would like to record this, I know this is not true anymore, unfortunately, but if you would like to record this, her speech to the nation, we will just need to put Queen Elizabeth in the chair, put a desk next to her, in a room, start the camera rolling, that's it. If you would like to mimic that in a video game, then it's engine programmer, rendering programmer, 
QA tester, CA artist, 3D modeler, texturator, QA tester again. Uh, yes, probably. Uh, animator, animation rigger, animator, uh, QA tester again, uh, lighting artist, uh, AI programmer. Yeah, my hand hurts. I, I specifically put that in the in the presentation so you can feel my pain and how painful it is to recreate a, a scene like this in a game. The conclusion is, of course, QA testers are, are important. So if we have QA testers here. I really bow to you because you're the hardest and most underappreciated work in the game industry. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Without you, we are all screwed. But aside from that, making games is difficult. And making games requires a lot of people. And it's not only the thing I started with that there's a game designer, there's like a whole group, whole team of people who are better specialists. But it's also about Game designers' work, in a way, is to find the best possible solution to our problem at hand. The, the best way to fill the frame we have mentioned previously. Of course, it doesn't mean that it, has to, that it has to be your idea. Usually, it isn't your idea, your game designer idea. But, let's, but, but of course, you have your, your ideas. And, um, so, first of all, you talk with other people to learn holes in your ideas. They look at those things from their perspectives, the programmer know how the code works, how everything is structured in the engine, the animator, the, the sound guy, everyone has a, has a slightly different perspective. And most probably you forgot about some of those dependencies. So that's why it's important to have that village of people around you to make sure that your feature will work. Another thing is, um, okay, so that's it. And of course, we are also different people. And being different people, we perceive things differently. So I have the saying that, okay, if, if there's something in the game I don't like or I like, I know that behind me there's a group of people who think like me who will also like it or dislike that feature. That's one thing. But another thing is that, this is just a group of people that will play the game, and there, there will be way more people that will have a different outlook. That's why it's important to have that village behind you and back you up. One trick that you might use if you don't have that village, I don't know, you work remotely or in a very small team, there are a couple of techniques that you can use and apply to look at things from different perspectives. Just quickly, there's this whole line of like methodology called design thinking with plenty of good source material online. So just type into YouTube, Google, design thinking. You will see a lot how you can help your creativity and help you choose the best solutions without discussing this with tons of people. And of course, some classic approaches like the six thinking hats, a technique def def defined, invite, in, uh, in inventor, invite, uh, invented by Edward De Bono, a guy who's known for starting talking about lateral thinking. So six design, uh, six thinking hats. This is a funny thing where you kind of look at a problem and then pretend that you change the hat looking at the problem from this different perspectives. This is something that you can do even when you're, when you're working by yourself alone on a game. You just sit naked in your bathroom, code it, paint it, make sounds for it. Again, there's a method that you could look at the game from different perspectives using the six thinking hats. Check it online. Number eight. I think you will like uh, the next one. It is from my great friend, Bartosz Kulongwowa, with a monkey. Uh, actually, Bartosz is here, monkey is there. So, <laughs> what he said, and he constantly reminds all of us about this, that you should rest. Resting is also a part of your job. Like, and there are reasons for it. Okay, so, asking developers, we always want to do more. We always want to prove that we are the best game developers in the world, which I'm sure you and us, everyone, are. So this quite often leads to crunch, to working too much, to spending too much, like, too much focus, too much energy, too much time on a feature that you're working on. And it can be effective, like, of course, differently for different people. 
but I think it's really effective for maybe two weeks, three weeks. Like human beings aren't made to work so excessively for longer periods of time. And it's an illusion that you can do that longer. So if you are, if you, if you start realizing that you, you, you crunching, whatever that means for you, longer, please try to be kind of serious and, um, I miss a word, truthful about it. And please start observing yourself if it's not the case that you just think you are more effective, but in, in truth you're just making more, more mistakes. And you actually jeopardize the success of the project. So that's, even if you feel that you have to work, that like the whole world will fall apart if you don't work, please don't work. Think about yourself, force yourself to rest. This is as important as attending a morning stand-up at your studio. It is your responsibility for your mind, for your body, for the project, for the team, that you are fully effective and rested when you work. Please take care of yourself. So that's number nine. Uh, get rested, get inspired. Another thing that Bartosz is saying that if you rest, if you really need to, if you, if you cannot rest just like laying in the sun or with the leisure, then please at least use that time to get inspiration, to attend conferences like this, to read books, to, to, to keep your mind working. These are the nine truths. There are two more, two more bonus ones. So first, from this guy, Kendrick Lamar, he has this song called Humble, where he says, like, basically, be humble. And I think this is very important because this will keep your mind sane. So making games is a great adventure. I really think this is the, the, the best work you can have on planet Earth. Seriously, uh, but it's also complex, as you can see. It's like constantly, it's, 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 a, it's an industry that constantly puts difficulties in front of you. So when you start this adventure, there's no guarantee that the project will be successful, that you will even complete it. So the best thing you can do is to approach it with a cool head and try to be humble about it and try to learn from everything that you do, even if, if, if in the end it doesn't work as, as you want it. So good luck on all of your adventures. Once again, game, is, game development is the best adventure in the world. And the last one, it's from a guy who actually, I'm not sure if he's in the audience because he was supposed to be here. I, I, I think a couple of you know him, Mazen Sukar. One thing I have learned from him, I worked with him for a couple of months and he ends all of the meetings with, it will all be fine. It will all be the It really will be. So enjoy life, enjoy game development, and thank you for your attention. So if you have any questions, I can actually answer them.